Well, um, in the tradition of the Coast Spring Harbor meeting, we usually have a keynote speaker uh, who is uh, from not from our so not immediately in our in our field and. Um, uh, uh, wonderful keynotes. We learned a lot, and very. So I guess maybe the uh, intention of the funding organizers, they engineered us for us to sort of uh, sit back, relax, and zoom out, sort of have some ideas, and maybe in in the future be be something that is that is helpful. So so this time we have the great fortune to um, have Eric Bazic to be our keynote. Um, uh, so Eric will uh, talk about uh, his um, interest and, and journey in making uh, new microscopes that never existed. Will be empowering our, our research, and um, um, and I think it will be very different from us. It's a different kind of uh, uh, thinking, different kind of uh, very very good for our brain. But I think in the meantime you may not have a very good rest because you will find that many of the wonderful microscopes that Eric invented, um, I'm confident that our field has not taken full advantage of. So you'll be busy thinking about how can I use this microscope. Um, and also he'll be talking about some new things that he's working on. So, so because of that, you may not have a very good rest, uh, but you can have that later in the, in the bar. Um, so a little bit about Eric. Um, Eric uh, received his Bachelor of Science in Physics uh, uh, from Caltech, and after that he went to his um, graduate training at the Cornell University and studied uh, um, um, applied and engineering physics. Um, um, so um, after that, he went to the Bell Lab, uh, worked there for quite a few years as a scientist. Um, and from his PhD work and his time at Bell, uh, Bell Lab, um, he worked on um, near-field optics. I'm not pretending I, I understand it. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> near-field optics, but, but it's an early form of super-resolution microscopy. So this indicates, this I understand that Eric has an interest in super-resolution uh, many years ago already. So this is a, maybe an early form. Maybe you can enlighten us a little bit about that. And then um, and after that, Eric uh, left academia and went to um, uh, machine tool industry uh, for a few years. And a little bit later, he got together with a friend, um, uh, Harold Hess, and, and uh, uh, created the first uh, single... Uh, super-resolution single molecular localization scope in the living room of uh, Harold Hess. Quite amazing. Maybe we can talk about career path with a, a different kind of career. So, um, so, so this, uh, you know, we heard a lot of, about, about companies being created in somebody's garage, and I haven't heard uh, in more recent history that someone discover science in somebody's living room. So it's quite amazing. Next time when you buy a house, think about, don't fill the house with furniture all the time. Think about a corner where you can do some experiments. Um, so um, with this, um, uh, and because of uh, this work, um, Eric um, uh, uh, co-shared Nobel Prize uh, in tw uh, uh, 2014 uh, for chemistry, for super resolution. And, um, and luckily, uh, Eric is still continuing uh, to make more microscopes. Uh, I, I'm not, um, I will not say more than that. And uh, with that, please uh, well, well, join me to welcome Eric. Well, thank you. You uh, kind of refreshing to go to the poster session here. I kind of believe that there was nothing in neuroscience except systems neuroscience until I walked around here and saw there was a whole other world here. So that was great. <laughs> so, um, uh, so yeah, I make microscopes. And uh, microscopes have been around for a long time, since the 17th century. And until the 20th century, they were really the dominant way by which we understood living things at the submillimeter scale. But um, by the end of the 19th century, the microscopes hit a wall of all they could see. And although there were you know, various little tech, fundamentally, the microscope you could buy in 1980 wasn't that different from the microscope you could buy in 1880. And as a result, in the 20th century, by the 1930s, biochemistry became big. And shortly thereafter, molecular biology became big. And today, those are the dominant tools or, or, or worldviews by which biologists seem to try to understand living systems. And to a degree, imaging has taken a back seat because of the power of those methods. But that has to change again um, in the 1980s. Various unrelated technological improvements. 
The first was the transistor, which eventually led to the PC and accessible computing to control microscopes. It also led to very sensitive detectors like CCD detectors, so you could look at very low photon counts. Next was uh, um, immunohistochemistry, so that we could have fluorescent labels to label specific proteins in cells, which we didn't have before. And then in the 90s, of course, GFP came on the scene, and we let the do the work and get live cells to express. Uh, and then the final piece of the puzzle was lasers, so that we could excite those fluorophores very cleanly and then have protein-specific contrast. So really, since the 1980s, there's been an exponentially increasing curve of development of microscopes. You've seen that in your own work with confocal microscopes and two-photon microscopes <laughs> that you're very familiar with, but there's a whole new series of other new microscopes that are coming onto the scene because of stirring the pot of these different technologies in different ways. So I had the dumb luck to get in on this in the very beginning to graduate school and worked on that near field technique Yemen talked about. In that case, we would use a sharp probe like an electrophysiology probe that was coated with metal. It would have a sub-wavelength hole on it, so you shine light through it. The light that comes out the hole is smaller than the wavelength of light. It's a little nano flashlight. You drive that around the cell and you get your image. Um, it worked, as you can see on the right there, to beat the diffraction limit. But it was basically a major pain in the ass, and it was very limiting because you can only look at things within about 20 nanometers of the surface. Eventually, I was able to see single molecules. It was cool. I was the first one to see them at room temperature. But more importantly, I was the first to be able to show that you could localize their positions to much smaller than the wavelength of light. So as Yuman said, I got fed up with science around 1995, and I quit and worked in the machine tool industry for 10 years, failed at that, and decided to come back to science. <laughs> and uh, and uh, grass is always greener on the other side. And, um, and um, the way out was based on this observation. But if that little dot there is a protein molecule, blob is what you see in a normal microscope because of its limited resolution. And I think you'd all agree that I can point to that fuzzy to the center of that fuzzy blob with much bit better precision than its diameter. The problem is, is that in a biological sample, the molecules are so close, those fuzzy blobs overlap, and you can't do anything with that. So in 2005, when my buddy Harold and I were looking, to, he was also in industry and wanted to get back into science. We were looking around, we visited Florida State, and we learned about a new type of fluorescent protein, which initially is non-fluorescent until you shine violet light on it, it becomes fluorescent, so photoactivated fluorescent proteins. And then that put the light bulb on our, on our heads to say, well, hey, if we turn down the violet light so low, we could turn on just stochastically a few of the molecules at once. Their fuzzy blobs would likely be separated. We could find the positions of those fuzzy blobs to a very high precision, and then turn on another subset, another subset, and another. So that's called photoactivated localization microscopy, or POM, and that's what eventually took me to Stockholm. So we were excited about this idea, but we were as we said, this is so freaking simple. Why hasn't anybody done this already? So rather than writing a grant or getting VC funding, we said, screw it, let's do it ourselves. Um, the good news is that you know when I left Bell Lab, Harold is much smarter than I, because when I left Bell, I told him to go to hell. But when Harold left, he was able to take all of his equipment with him. <laughs> so, so 10 years later, we pulled that out of the storage shed. And, and normally, we do it in a garage. but. We could do it in his living room because he wasn't married, so there was nobody to <laughs> to doing that. And within built, we were two physicists who knew nothing about biology, literally nothing. But I had the good fortune to contact Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz, who was one of the co-inventors of that photoactivated fluorescent protein, and she invited us to bring the microscope over. And in another month, we were cutting 70 nanometer thick cryosections. This is through a multivesicular body in the cell with a fluorescent protein label. And you can see the regular resolution and the palm resolution. And to better appreciate what you can get, you can get about 20 nanometer resolution with a microscope you can build in your living room. The problem was it was 
easy. I mean, from the microscopy side. I mean, making all the fusions and all that crap and the limited number of labels and blah, blah. I could bitch forever about all the problems with Palm, and I will. But, but, uh, but, but I will say, though, that at least it's fundamentally easy to do, and so it took off very quickly. So the first couple of years, we did a number of applications. One with uh, Jan Lippard at Berkeley as we looked at chemotaxis receptors in E. coli. And they end up clustering with large quantities at the poles, small cultures in the middle. That whole distribution is predictable in terms of a stochastic model of self-assembly that doesn't require any kind of active transport to get that distribution. Um, we were able to show that many proteins that look co-localized at the diffraction limit in this case, you're looking at focal adhesions, the points of contact of the cell to the ECM. Many of these proteins that look co-localized or not and form, in this case, nanaggregates here. Um, a group from EMBL did a beautiful experiment where they looked at the nuclear pore, where there was an ambiguity in the cryo-EM data on the orientation of certain protein subunits inside of the nuclear pore, resolved by using um, super resolution. Harold built the ultimate three-dimensional palm microscope in, and in a very laborious study with Claire Waterman was able to deduce the entire structure of the focal adhesion from the ECM to the cytoskeleton and all the proteins in between and how they're organized. Um, and Harold did another study with Jennifer where they looked at the escort protein involved in HIV scission and they were able to show that it doesn't just form the scrolls you see in EM on the membrane, but the escort actually has to invade the itself to create the, the fission. So that's all good news there, but then there's lots of bad news, as I said, with Palm. The first is the vast majority of any super resolution technique that people have done has been looking at fixed cells, and the EM community is known for a very long time that fixatives screw up ultrastructure, as you can see here. If you use uh, paraformaldehyde and glutaraldehyde versus a high-pressure frozen sample, you just don't have the detail that you have here in lots of artifacts. So recently, Harold and I have bit the bullet. Harold is actually a low-temperature physicist. So we decided to tackle this by doing high-pressure freeze super resolution, but then we need to keep vitreous, so we decided to bite the bullet and go to helium temperatures for various physics reasons we want to explore. And so here you can see um, two cells. This is a chemically fixed cell, and this is the high-pressure frozen cell. And if you zoom in, you see exactly what you see with the EM in terms of how the ultrastructure is messed up. So it's difficult to do things right, okay? I mean, it's easy to get... I always say the, the bad thing about microscopy is it's easy to get an image, but it's very difficult to get an image in the end. And that's never more true than with Palm. So our other motivation for going cold is, um, so Harold is, again, the, the best scientist I've known in my life, and he's basically, in some ways, saved Janelia's ass by creating this focused ion beam milling scanning, uh, block face scanning electron microscopy pipeline to image fly brains and doing the connectome. But an offshoot of that is it's then trivial to be able to do single cells, so we built this to do high resolution, high precision correlation of solution with um, the global contrast that you get from the electron microscopy. And this is still an ongoing project with many things that we want to try, but I think this is ultimately the way we need to get to the point where we can do sort of 10 nanometer type level registration of where proteins are in relation to the rest of the cell. But even if we succeed at that, um, by 2008, I was as sick of palm as I was of, of near-field microscopy in 1995. And one of the reasons is that almost everything we were doing was on, on fixed cells. And I heard a talk by Scott Frazier then at Caltech, and he said, if the goal of biology is to understand the rules of the game by which molecules self-assemble to create living things, then just as if you were wanted to understand the rules of a football game, you're never going to understand it by looking at just snapshots. Because you'll just see the quarterback going back to throw a pass, you'll see the cheerleaders making a pyramid on the sideline, you'll say, how are those events related? But if you can just watch the movie, it becomes apparent. And at that point I said, shit, I've 
life, I need to look at living things. Um, and you can do this with Palm. And so one of the halfway houses is something we developed with Jennifer called single particle tracking Palm, where you're not trying to get a zillion localizations and then find out every position in a static cell. You look at a live cell and you photoactivate a subset and you watch how that subset diffuses or aggregates or whatever. So on left you're seeing two different proteins, one that's highly mobile in the plasma membrane and one which is not that you can see by this. You're seeing a recent example by my colleague James Lewis, um, who looked at um, the Huntington protein and then the mutant that has this glutamine repeat which creates these aggregates. So these are the nuclei of two live cells, the uh, wild type and the mutant. You can see the aggregates, but what was interesting was he also co-labeled a certain transcription factor. And he found the transcription factor molecules actually get caught up in these aggregates like quicksand. And so potentially one could conceive that there's a previously un unsuspected possibility that the transcription could be down-regulated factors getting caught in these aggregates and having an influence for that reason. So, but even with the SPT palm, you're still running into the fact that you have to localize lots of molecules and lots and lots of images. And so if you think about it more generally, there's always trade-offs in any form of microscopy. So if you want to have super high resolution at the apex of that pyramid, that means your image has to have more pixels. If it has more pixels, it means you're taking more measurements. That's going to take more time. It means you're throwing more potentially damaging light at the You have higher toxicity and slower speed. And so that's, that's the price you pay there. Um, so eventually I realized again that, that all the people in super resolution were monomaniacally focusing on the one parameter you first think about microscopes, resolution, to the detriment of thinking about what they were losing with everything else. The guy who was much smarter than all of the rest of us in this regard was Mats Gustafsson, who developed a different form of super resolution as a postdoc at ASF in the 90s called structured illumination. In this technique, instead of illuminating your cell uniformly, you put a grating of illumination on it, and then that grating actually creates beat frequencies against the structure in the sample that are at a lower frequency that your microscope can see. So the downside of SIM is the resolution is limited to only a 2x gain beyond the diffraction limit, or about 100 nanometers, whereas you know palm can go 20 nanometers or below. But despite that, it is because you take so many fewer images and because the intensities are so much lower, you can look at a cell like this at sub-second time points. This is way better than you could ever do with Palm. And yeah, the resolution's only 100 nanometers, but look at all the information you get by that pretty darn good spatial resolution coupled with that pretty darn good temporal resolution for a long period of time to see the dynamics of the ER or in turf here, to watch this immunological synapse form with this URCAT cell against an antigen presenting cover slip. So um, the bad news is that we, well, the good news is we were able to recruit Mott's to be a group leader at Janelli in 2008. But the bad news is he was diagnosed with a in 2009 and he died in 2011. So um, basically, I ended up inheriting his group. And I consider Mott's the messiah of SIM. And I am his acolyte, still trying to spread his gospel. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to show was that 100 nanometer resolution limit was not fundamental. In fact, Mats was working on this when he passed away. And so what we can do is we can play the same photoactivating tricks that we use for Palm to create a nonlinearity in structure microscopy, which, as you can see, and take the resolution down to 60 nanometers. Then we can look at sort of half second frame rates for about 30 frames. So it's not as fast as the 10 frames a second I was showing on the, on the URCAT cell, and it's not as many frames, but that's what I was saying about the trade-offs in that tetrahedron I was showing. But it does allow us to poke at a different place in that tetrahedron at a different resolution level. Uh, my postdoc Dong then in this paper was able to show that we could actually sort of begin to resolve the shapes of endosomes with this and look at their refinement uh, by the actin. 
the, the uh, recruitment of alpha actinin at Ruffles and at Philopodia in two colors with that technology. Um, Dong has uh, since left my group and gone to Institute of Biophysics in Peking, where he's done an amazing job of going instead of in turf. One of the challenges of SIM is it's a wide field technique, so if you have a thick cell, it doesn't work because of all the out of focus background. But if you go just outside of turf, you can illuminate just the bottom of the cell, and then you can look at all the organelles with micron closest to the sample and or interactions between organelles or the organelles in the cytoskeleton. In this case, you can see how the ER forms along the microtubule. You can see how things get trapped, the lysosomes get trapped in pockets. They can get pulled by the, by the microtubules and then remodel the, uh, the ER as it goes along. Here's fissioning and fusioning of, of the mitochondria due to the ER. And here we're looking at a whole Drosophila embryo um, and halfway through embryogenesis and dorsal closure where the epithelial uh, comes around, these amnios contractions, positive feedback contractions of actomycin here that then you can see these single actin filaments inside of these guys as they're doing this. So pretty damn good resolution, even in a whole organism in this case. Again, only the very surface of it, but still pretty interesting. So some of the other SIM applications we've done since, one is to look again at uh, myosin-2 and how the monomers form these bipolar filaments that draw together actin filaments. And what we found is that start with an initial bipolar filament and then forming de novo, that one kind of acts as a template for which others start to peel off. So you start to get this sort of avalanche or cascade of existing, mono, existing bipolar filaments acting as, as sort of a substrate for new ones to form instead of de novo formation. We were also able to show um, that formin is necessary for the creation of the immunological synapse and the warping of actin to create that, that circumferential structure that you see here with John Hammer's group H. Uh, with Tobias Meyer's group at Stanford, uh, collective migration of endothelial cells, and it appeared at lower resolution as if the actin cytoskeleton actually is continuous from one cell to the other. But we were able to show that instead what's actually happening is there are trailing fingers from the leading cells that are cadherin rich to which the trailing cell then attaches, and then its actin cytoskeleton remodels next to the cytoskeleton of the leading cell. So it just appears that they're connected, but they're not. Um, with Jennifer's group, we eventually recruited her from NIH to Genelia. And we're looking again at the dynamics of uh, the ER. And in the textbook models of the peripheral ER, you have tubules and sheets. But we were able to show that most of these sheets are just a result of too low resolution in either space or time. And if you have the speed and the resolution of SIM, a lot of these are just resolved into little tiny tubules that either coalesce and then come apart again or what have you. So all of that's fine, but even in that case, we're still kind of looking in flatland. Um, most of the discussed, and even 3D palm is pretty, pretty thin samples. You know, you're talking at the best with 3D SIM, 5, 10 microns thick. But, you know, obviously there's a lot of biology beyond 5 or 10 microns, and honestly, you know, the, the point is, is that, you know, the cell is a three-dimensional dynamic system. And so in order to really understand what's going on, getting to what Scott was saying about understanding the rules of life, you really need to have high resolution across all four dimensions of space and time at the same time. So when I was really frustrated with Palm, and before Mott's passed away, that's the tried to do when I basically turned my back on Palm long before the Nobel Prize. Um, and so the good news is that the standard tools that many of you are familiar with for doing 3D imaging leave a lot of room for improvement. They're basically the wide field microscope, the confocal microscope, and more recently the two photon microscope. Um, but for the wide field and confocal, they have a problem and that you usually use these in an epi configuration where the light comes down and the fluorescence goes back. And the challenge is that only a single plane in the specimen's in focus. 
blasting away at the entire thickness of the specimen as you're doing that. So you're creating all this unnecessary toxicity, all of this unnecessary bleaching of the surrounding regions. So one of the most important innovations in microscopy in this century was when Ernst Stelzer at the EMBL in 2005 reintroduced a 100-year-old idea called plane illumination. In this case, instead of bringing your light from above, use a cylindrical lens from the side to create a sheet of light, which is coincident with the focal plane. And because the regions below aren't illuminated at all, there's no background there, there's no toxicity there, the whole plane is illuminated at once, so you have a fast camera, you snap one picture, there's no scanning a point around, and you can move very quickly. So this has been very transformative for understanding embryogenesis at single cell resolution. But it has one limitation, which is that there's a trade-off between the, the field of view over which the light sheet can be flat and how thick the light sheet has to be. And if you want to go over even you know, 50 microns to 100 microns, your light sheet has to start to get to be about 3 microns thick. So it's good at single cell resolution, but I'm the guy who wants to do subcellular imaging, and it wasn't sufficient for that. But um, once I learned between Scott's talk and Ernst's talk about the opportunity, the solution was pretty obvious to a physicist, which is that there's a different kind of way of illuminating objectives rather than with a cone of light to a focus. And that's instead of filling the back pupil completely, you fill just a ring at the periphery, and then you get a hot cone of light which comes to the focus. And what it makes a focus which has no focus in Z. It's focused in X, Y, but in theory, if that annulus were infinitesimally thin, it would be infinitely long in Z. That's called a Bessel beam. That's exactly the technology that's used when you go to the supermarket and you go over the barcode thing. The laser there is working as a Bessel beam, so it's focused at any distance to read that barcode. So basically, we took that technology and eventually, over the course of a few years and several papers, realized that, well, it would be better to create an array of Bessel beams sheet, that became what we call the lattice light sheet microscope. And so, yeah, it's thin enough, yeah, it's fast enough, but what was shocking was how much less toxic it is to image in 3D with this lattice light sheet than it is with, say, a confocal microscope. And if there's one thing I've learned in a decade of live imaging is that while the total dose of light you throw at your specimen is important, by far a much more important metric of toxicity is the instantaneous power. So a confocal microscope, one spot of light, is that going along and creating death and destruction in its wake as it's going through the cell. And by spreading that light out, it's a highly nonlinear relationship. You get far less toxicity and damage. So that turned out to be a winner. And so this is from our 2014 paper on the lattice light sheet tech. It's a really great tool for doing subcellular imaging of single cells um, at high resolution for ridiculously long times. 1,200 volumes of this cell, three volumes per second of uh, tetra um, no bleaching, uh, and two-dimensional images that are condensed into that one movie. Here we're looking at um, motility of a neutrophilic cell in a collagen mesh in 3D. Here you're looking at three organelles once in a slab as those cells divide. Here you're looking at the initial divisions of C. elegans. Here you're looking at, um, you know, uh, um, dictostelium, a slime mold amoeboid. And when we have our collaborators there to, to take this data, and we render that movie and they look at that lightning bolt, they say, what the hell is that? And we don't know, you're the biologist, you tell us. Not to pat myself on the back too much, but I have never felt more like Galileo than I have with this microscope. We've had over 70 different groups come to my lab to use it, and everybody goes away with views of their specimens that they have never seen before. Big smiles on their faces and 10 terabytes of data. And then a month later, they call us up crying into the phone because they have no idea what to do with 10 terabytes of data. <laughs> and that is exactly the Achilles heel of this now, and I will say about that later on. So, 
I'm going to skip the single molecule applications, as cool as they are, um, and go through some of the other applications. So, um, like I said, we've had 70 groups in our own lab. We've also developed an imaging center just for you guys, just for outside people to come and use all of these tools. So we have a lattice light sheet, we have a SIM microscope, we have an eye palm microscope, and it's all free for you guys to come and use. And Janelia is very well set up to take your mice, to take your flies, to take your cells and whatever. You can send them in advance. We'll take good care of them. They'll all be staged and ready to go when you walk in the door to take data. And you too can walk away with 10 terabytes of data you won't know what to do with. But in any case, um, so here's an example of a group in Japan um, which was interested in understanding uh, microtubules during mitosis. There was a debate about whether microtubules in mitosis only form at the centrosomes or whether they can form at the metaphase plate. And by tracking EB1 on the ends of these microtubules and looking at the trajectories, they were able to deduce that basically you could get tubules at the plate. In a group with, in a collaboration with Tommy Kirkhausen's group at Harvard, he studies clathrin, and now we do a lot with Tommy, so we do a lot of clathrin. But in migrating cells, at the front edge, there's this ruffling uh, um, uh, surface. And so what he was able to show is that on the bottom of the cell, endocytosis is happening normally. But in the ruffling area, endocytosis is shut down. And so his hypothesis is that if exocytosis is normally, you therefore get an imbalance in membrane at the leading edge, which creates those ruffles. Then behind that, endocytosis goes into overdrive to create an imbalance the other way to then take in that excess membrane. Um, we worked with Jillian Griffiths at, at um, Cambridge to look not at a Urcat cell against a cover slip, but a true primary T cell from a mouse against a dendritic cell, and then study the immunologic immunological synapse in 3D in that organization. Um, again, with Tommy's group, he's interested in mechanisms of class-dependent endocytosis. So we had labeled Shiga toxin, and they calibrated their instrument for single molecule sensitivity. And they were able to quantify the sizes of the cargos by both mechanisms, and they found that Clathrin-independent endocytosis is more common in this case than clathrin-dependent, but because the cargos are bigger with clathrin-dependent, the majority of the, of the toxin that comes in still comes in through the clathrin means. Um, we helped Max Crummel at UC, an immunologist there, build his own lattice microscope. But again, he looked at T cells and studied at the very beginning of the formation of the synapse the microvilli on the T cells that start to feel against the dendritic cell and was able to show that these microvilli actually sense 98% of the surface of the dendritic cell within two minutes to figure out if it's the right type of T cell. Um, and in another collaboration with Jennifer, um, we went to doing six organelles at once in linear unmixing of the colors to look at what she calls the organelle interaction to see how each one of those organelles the others over time. So all of that's good news with the lattice, but of course we got greedy and decided we wanted to start doing lattice microscopy in multicellular systems, and there we start running into trouble pretty quickly. Um, you can see here again during dorsal closure that the resolution starts to degrade as we go through the first layer of cells. Um, you can see this is just one plane inside of a, of a worm just before it hatches here. And again, it's just kind of fuzzy. Here we work with Marion to look at neural crest stem cells that then migrate to the olfactory epithelium. And yeah, it's okay, but you know, by our standards of what we had on the single cell stuff, it's just not there. Um, and so the problem is, is that once you start going into multiple cell layers, there's so many different things of different refractive index from nuclei to um, to mitochondria, to, to differences in the cytosol or whatever, that all of this stuff warps the light rays of the light sheet going in. So in this case, you can see these, these uh, um, chromosomes are 
here, but the light sheet is bloomed by here. Or these histones are fine if the light just goes here to the objective, but if the light has to go from these nuclei, then it has to go through the embryo, and then they're screwed up. So it's just like the water on your windshield. So we're kind of screwed. And so we had to fix that problem. The good news is I give a talk once a year about the historical connections between astronomy and microscopy. And the take home message of that talk is that microscopists are the retarded stepchildren of astronomers and we steal everything they ever did years ago after they invented it first. So this is an example of that same thing. So, um, so this problem of aberrations is a big deal in astronomy because the atmosphere does the exact same damn thing. Well, they came up with two solutions. So there's the Crab Nebula, the exact same picture I had on my wall in high school when I wanted to be an astronaut from the Hale Telescope, which for 50 years was the biggest telescope on Earth. Uh, and then here's the Hubble Space Telescope, which is one solution. If the atmosphere is a problem, get rid of the atmosphere telescope above the atmosphere and with what it looks like now understand that the that the mirror in the Hubble is half the size of the one of the hail and shouldn't do anywhere near as well but because it doesn't have those aberrations it does about 10 10 times better so there is an analogy in biology which probably a lot of you are familiar with in this crew which is clearing um, and so what we can do is we can introduce chemical agents to homogenize the refractive index of the tissue to make our imaging clearer and better. All sorts of things from clarity, disco, scale. One of the more interesting and recent clearing strategies is something called expansion microscopy developed by Ed Boyden's group. So um, what they do is they infuse the tissue with a uh, polyacrylamide gel they then cross-link that. Um, they chemically attach the fluorophores that were in your, the sample to the gel. They then put in a protease and digest away all the biological stuff. And then they change the salt concentration from PB to pure water. And the gel expands diaper. And so there's your fly brain here, and then this is your fly brain there. Um, they had a paper in 2015 in Science and obviously, as a super resolution guy, I was quite interested. I read it, and I thought it was complete and utter bullshit. Um, I didn't believe a word of it. Um, but then in early 2016, two of his postdocs, Ray and Sho, called me up and said, you know, we're having trouble imaging bigger samples with this. Can we come and try your lattice light sheet? And I said, yeah, sure, come on down. And I was going to have them down, and I was going to rub their noses into it, you know, and say, <laughs> Yes, this is bullshit. Look at this. Look at this. Well, we threw it in, and this is what we see with mouse tissue. And I said, shit. <laughs> you could knock me down with a feather when I saw that. I couldn't believe that it would be that faithful in terms of what you could see. So you can see over, you know, I mean, you can see, you know, every axon going along. You can see every spine neck, and it's like, Damn, I mean, this, is, this was pretty amazing. I was still incredibly skeptical even then, but at least I was willing to, to give it a And so for the last couple of years, we've been working to see where this might be useful or where not. So um, one of the problems, of course, with expansion is, is your sample's bigger. So even if you do just a simple 4x expansion, volumetrically, that's 4 cubed or 64. So that means you have 64 times as much stuff to go through, which if you're talking a fly brain or, or the cortex of the mouse, takes a fucking long time. And then furthermore, in a normal microscope like a confocal, you're going to bleach the crap out of that. So lattice is a good marriage. This is an example of three-color imaging, looking is a marker of myelin casper for the nodes of Ranvier, and then thi one yfp is a sparse uh, cytosolic expression in some of the neurons. And we're going all the way from the damn white matter up to the dura, and it's all nice and continuous. You can start to trace neurons across that whole length, so here's one of them. Here's first a little um, uh, dendrite at top. We work with Neurolucida, a company who has a commercial package for um, quantifying um, uh, spines. So we looked at 1,500 spines from and
and characterized, um, for example, head diameters, backbone lengths, all sorts of parameters that you can get out of this. To the extent that you can compare it against the literature, and our, our data is a lot more extensive than what we can find in the literature, it all seems to match up pretty damn well. Um, with the channel with the other colors, for example, we can see where the, where the myelination starts on the axon, so you can determine the length of the pre-myelinated axon segment. We did that in a number of that we segmented. Um, the axon, all of the myelination is continuous. In layer six, there's two populations, an intermittent population and a continuous population. Um, the layer six ones have uh, shorter initial segments than layer five. The volumes of the intermittents are smaller than that. You can find all sorts of different correlations. This is the white matter we're going through. Now we're going down to the first of the nodes of Ranvier here, marked by the Casper at the sides, and then also the break in the, in the myelin. And you can see the uh, side axons coming off. Um, we looked at the nodes of Ranvier and all the cells in this volume and showed that in all cases, they basically the separation between the nodes increased as you go farther along the neuron. This is one particular neuron here now that we've, that we've isolated to look at, at the data. Um, we also looked uh, at other neurons and, and, the, um, and the myelination there and found out that the, that the G ratio, the diameter of the sheath to the axon is not not a fixed number at all, and in fact, the axon is concentric in the myelin sheath, but actually kind of moves around in there, which is kind of what you're seeing plotted in this colors as we're going around there. Um, it also works with fly brains. The nice thing about fly brains is we're kind of limited in the size of samples we can put in the lattice microscope to things that are only a few millimeters big, but the complete fly brain fits just snugly and nicely inside of the microscope. So here is a fly brain that um, one of the Jerry's 6,000 fly brains. This one has the dopaminergic neurons with a membrane label. And then we have uh, a uh, NC82 marker for synapses in this case. So as we've been going along, we, we computationally color different colors for different neuropil regions there. <laughs> And then we did an analysis on this. The first thing is we did, we compared in the alpha-3 lobe of the mushroom body, which is the only part for which we have a good quantitative number of the number of synapses from the FibSim pipeline, and compared that to what we uh, got with EXM, and it matches up great, but it was easy for us to then count the number of synapses across the whole brain. There's 30 million synapses across the brain, half a million of them synapse onto the dopaminergic neurons. So um, we're also able to break down the density of synapses in every neuropil region and the fraction of each neuropil region, which is, which is uh, the volumetric fraction taken up by the dopaminergic neurons. We can break down each one of those regions into distributions of the synaptic density within each neuropil region. Um, we also can take other fly lines these uh, PPM3 projection neurons, eight, there's eight of those. We were able to trace them from their distal things into the um, central complex and then find out exactly which part of the central complex they innervate. Um, we were able to do a study where we, where we looked a little bit at stereotypy. So we did five different flies to look at these DC3 projection neurons that come across into the calyx and then the lateral horn. And you can see from these different colors here that represent samples, there's different numbers of boots um, and different volumes as well. Oh, I got five minutes, I better get cooking. Okay, so, um, so now I'll do the funnest part. So all of that's great and that's where expansion with lattice light sheet is now. Um, people are starting to apply that heavily at Genelia. There are two microscopes specifically dedicated for expansion lattice. So if you have any desires to do this kind of thing, contact me and I'll put you in touch with those folks. Um, the last problem though is, remember I'm the guy who's not looking at dead stuff anymore. And I've, I've 
basically saying nothing, something's impossible after that, after I had my egg on the face with the expansion, but I think I'm pretty safe to say nobody's going to be doing expansion on live samples anytime soon. <laughs> so um, if you want to do live, you've got to come up with a different solution. The astronomer, astronomers saved our butts again because what they do is something called adaptive optics if you have a ground-based telescope. So what they do is they shine a light into the stratosphere from a laser to create an artificial fluorescent star and then the light from the galaxy they want to see in that bright object stratosphere, they both get distorted in the same way. They pick off the light from the artificial star, put it in a sensor to find out how it's been aberrated. Then they close a loop in a computer to change the shape of a mirror to exactly cancel those aberrations and get back to diffraction limited performance. So boom, you go like that to that. So now the best ground-based telescopes, because they have bigger apertures, kick the ass of the Hubble Space Telescope for imaging in the visible. They're not so great in other parts, in the IR, they're not so great in the visible. Um, so you can do the exact same trick in, in where we use two photon microscopy to create just a spot of light that we can drive around anywhere there's fluorescence to create a guide star and then um, go through the exact same principle with a wavefront sensor, deformable mirror. This is looking in a zebrafish with a pan membrane labeling um, in the spinal cord. The low signal and the low resolution is is because of the aberrations, we turn on the AO and there you go. So on the right here, we do this with a confocal micro microscope to do multicolor. Um, here you see 150 microns deep, that pink is the mitochondria. Now you turn on the AO and then once you deconvolve it, you can see that mitochondrial network as good as if that were a cell on a cover slip, slip instead of being buried inside of this fish and then that's the plasma membrane. Here we're going through a subset of neurons in the, in, the, in the fish. 200 microns deep in the midbrain, we're turning off the adaptive optics there. That's what you would see with a standard two photon microscope. That's what you see with a two photon microscope with the adaptive optics turned on. So obviously we wanted to do this with our lattice technology instead of the point scanning technologies that I've already pissed on before. So basically you need two AO loops, one to correct the light sheet going in and one to correct the light coming back out. So it gets complicated. But once you've done all that pain and anguish, it works pretty well. Here's a human stem cell derived organoid, intestinal organoid. Um, you can't really see the clathrin coated pits, but you turn on the AO and boom, now you can see all the pits, good enough that you can track them, look at and apical surfaces and rates of endocytosis. Um, we can apply that, of course, to looking at um, organelles and, and what they do. So um, here we have three different organelles labeled in the early brain of a zebrafish embryo. Um, and we have Golgi in the, in the membranes, the ER, and a dye for some of the mitos. We're able to show differences in different cell types in different regions and the sizes of these organelles. The brain seems particularly active with the Golgi larger than in other cells and the rates of endocytes a bit faster in the early brain than in the other organs. Um, you can then blow apart this computationally because the data is good enough and then you can zoom in on any cell you want within the volume and follow its course over time. Here's a dividing cell in this case. We see sort of stage divisions where they're not simultaneous but sequential where one, then the next, then the next go along. Um, we can, again, like I said, zoom into cells during division and see how the organelles are partitioned, partitioned between the daughter cells. I guess probably my most relevant movie for this audience, this is, this is working with Minoru Koyama, Chenelia, with an autobow technique, which is sort of a brain bow stochastic labeling, but you put in a drug at a particular time to, as to have sort of a pulse chase of turning on the fluorescence of only the new neurons at that time. And so um, here you can see um, the, the axons going back, you know, in each direction with the growth cones on the end of them. What we found is that the uh, head tail projecting axons tend to be very tight and in a line in the direction going with their filopodia. The um, 
central axons, though, splay out um, horizontally, perpendicular to the direction of motion as they go along, like you can see here and here and here. Um, but in either case, they always make a beeline just for the very outer part of, of what's being wired up. And so they all then go to there, and then when they, if they're head to tail, they could take a 90 degree turn, and then they start going along. So it kind of wires from the inside out. So another example of, again, trying to understand the cell in its native state, which is what this is all about, is looking at neutrophils again, but now in a physiological environment. So, um, so what you see is that they're incredible contortionists in their ability to move in the interstitial spaces between various cells. The blue is dextrin. We put in there sort of bait for them to be able to scoop up. This is the 3D representation. This is the hindbrain, the skin, a blood vessel. This is a fibroblast um, that's about to go into mitosis here. And then there's the neutrophil there. Um, so this is really where I wanted to be with live cell imaging. To have high resolution, I wanted it to be where all the environmental cues which drive gene expression, hence drive the phenotypes are there, and to see it in the most native form possible. And this microscope finally gets us there. Because I'm running out of time, I'll forget this. This is a xenograph model of cancer with um, human breast cancer cells and zebrafish. Um, so, like I said, that microscope is frankly a train wreck. Um, with th two adaptive optics and a lattice, it filled a 10-foot table. So for the last year, we've been designing a new microscope. And so I often say, you know, that because of the hedron I showed, there's no one microscope that can do it all. Just like you can't have a car take the kids to daycare on Friday and win at Monte Carlo on, on Sunday. You can't have a microscope that does everything. But once you have a lattice light sheet microscope with adaptive optics, you have to buy linear lasers. You have to buy a two-photon laser. You have to have objectives. You have to have galvos. Well, every microscope has those. So yeah, not, not one microscope modality can do everything, but there's no law. You can't put every microscope in one box and have other components. So basically, this thing has become an adaptive optical Swiss army knife, we call it. So it has all of these modes of operation. Everything I've talked about in this talk, this, mi this microscope will be able to do. Um, we have worked very hard with vendors because a lot of people replicated our lattice scope. So I said, treat us like an OEM and give us cheap prices and keep that for anybody who wants to replicate it. So this microscope will be hopefully a little bit south of $400,000, but it will do everything and with adaptive optics. So if you want to look at your with adaptive optics with either a two photon mode, if it's too scattering, or a lattice mode or a confocal mode, you can press a button and switch and try one modality or the other. So we've just got the components for this and we're just starting to build it. It will be built by the end of November, and we are looking for guinea pigs to try out different systems. So please, I'd love to hear from you if you guys have interesting things you'd like to try out. By next summer, this is going to go in our AIC at Genelia, and, um, and then you can apply to use it there. I'm also working on, that's the AIC, I'm also working on developing another AIC now that I'm at Berkeley. But this one is to address that 10 terabyte problem, which I have to say is no longer a 10 terabyte problem, thanks to the EXM paper and thanks to the AO lattice paper. It's a one petabyte problem now. <laughs> Both of those, one of those takes 300 terabytes in that paper and the other is a petabyte. Um, and it's only because we have the computational resource of the cluster of Genelia that it was possible to do the analysis that I just through there. Um, but basically, the Berkeley one is to be a full service center. So it's not just going to be about getting you the data and tossing you the 10 terabytes to cry with, but it's going to be about coming up with analysis solutions for you and making those analysis solutions open source so that others can then use it as they get their hands on this. So yeah, that's a good sign that I should shut up. So anyway, <laughs> so the last thing I just want to say is again, again, my egotistical 30,000 foot view of microscopy and the 20th century was largely dominated by 
biochemistry and molecular biology. And I think this is really needs to be a trinity. And now we finally, I believe, have the imaging tools so that we can now start to really understand the findings of biochemistry and molecular biology in the spatial and temporal context of the living cell in a physiological context. And I want you to just kind of take home the message that these tools exist. You may not have known about them. You may think that they're not accessible, but they are. And you should be thinking about as a new approach to add to your existence to be able to answer your questions. And with that, I'll just shut up and say, I mean, I've been blessed to work with many fantastic collaborators and particularly a great group of postdocs. Everything you've seen in that talk is the tip of an iceberg of data, which is much faster than that. Everything you've seen has been the net product of 10 years of effort by a group that averages three people at any one time. That's as big as my group gets. And I really feel that it's the smallness of our group that makes us as Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric, for this wonderful talk. Questions? So first, please, please pick UCLA. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're just down, uh, you know, you take a Southwest <laughs> flight, you can be there in an hour, man. Awesome. Right in Auckland, <laughs> you know. So I'm, I'm um, confocal technology yeah, first sure. appearing and then um, becoming, you know, something that you can teach More somebody ubiquitous, to. More ubiquitous, yeah. Yes, completely uh -huh. ubiquitous. Yeah, and uh -huh. I think that there are Sim and Palm are becoming yeah, they're more They're not that, there yet. Yeah. Then they're not there yet, but yeah, uh -huh. how, how do you, how, uh, how, <laughs> How do you get it there? <laughs> How do you get it? Thank you. Exactly. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. It, it, it look, it's incredible. We yeah. all, I, I can feel the whole room wanting this. Yeah, but, <laughs> but, but, but there's but, not but, one in every pot. Yet. Right. I mean, right. when confocal yeah. microscopy first came in, you need a clinician yeah, yeah. To, sh to help And they you. also suck. They would yeah, and they, all the they rest, suck. right? That's yeah, correct, so, yes. And the, and the computer would crash and all the rest. Yeah, I love yeah. that too. Yeah. Um, that's the way, in fact, for me, it's always very frustrating because we're developing a microscope and then another year, another microscope and another microscope. And yet, if you look at the history of particularly confocal and two photon, mm -hmm. you know, it's at least a decade before they mm -hmm. really start to gain traction. You know, Palm is now about a decade old and is kind of stabilizing. That's the easiest of these technologies that I've discussed. So, um, to me, it's a, a multi-step effort, right? First, you have to get people interested in the tech, right? First, you have to develop the tech. Then you have to get people to want it. No company is going to spend millions of dollars developing a product if they don't think there's a market, right? So a lot of our having that AIC and a lot of me bringing those 70 groups in is to create you know, a, a constituency that's going to advocate for these tools. So the, the good news is with the Lattice, that was successful. So um, Zeiss has the license to do the lattice. They are very far along the product development curve now, and they're supposed to launch that. They're going to have beta units out this spring, and they should have that product available and on the market by the end of next year, about a year from now. A little over there, yeah, ASCB 2019. That's the supposed product launch. So um, the AO and like that is going to take longer. Um, I'm, I'm always a guy who's very frustrated and impatient, but all I can say is come up to Berkeley when we got next spring we'll have one running and we can give it a shot. Appointments too, particularly in the early days, you know, I mean, nothing ever works the first time, right? <laughs> yeah. I've been in this a while, I do, yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Has the sample holder, the geometry of the sample, ever been a limitation in the lattice sheet? Yeah, so it, it, it's a limitation. For, so basically the lattice as it is right now, it uses water immersion objectives that are in the soup along with the sample at these angles and then the sample is here. So depending, yeah, it can be real limiting. Obviously you're not going to stick a mouse under a lattice scope, right? Um, I can't say anything more except to say that Zeiss has some answers, okay? Um, uh, but I also this multifunctional micro, the Swiss Army knife, 
I, that movie went by pretty fast, but there's actually an epi station, an upright station, and a lattice station. And you can work at any one of those. So therefore, if you've got a mouse, you can go to the upright station and you can do imaging with a Bessel beam, with a resonant with adaptive optics on it over there. And the next minute you can do, use the epi objective and do sim on a cell. And the next minute you can do lattice light sheet on another thing. So it's really meant to kind of try to cover as much of the bases as we can. But lattice itself is still evolving in terms of having a more flexible sample arrangement. Is, is there space there for that to be engineered so that the uh, sample, uh, different samples can be? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't get, so how far can you get into with the adaptive optics now? How, how deep? Uh, it depends the on the sample, obviously, okay. and the amount of scatter. Scatter, you see, adaptive optics doesn't correct scattering, it corrects ab aberration, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But they kind of go hand in hand, so if any of you guys do two photon microscopy deep, you know you start to lose signal and everything starts mm -hmm. to fuzz out, at, depending where you are, 500, 800 microns deep, right? Mm -hmm. Part of that is because of the scattering of the light. But part of it is because your focus going in, you know, two photon is nonlinear, requires a very tight focus to create signal. And the aberrations are blooming out that focus so it can't even produce the signal, leastwise it being getting scattered out. So with the AO, you definitely gain. With AO, my wife does AO plus three photon microscopy, and there she's able to go two millimeters deep. She can blast right through the white matter and beyond, right? So, yeah. All right. So it seems like if you want to uh, connect to biochemistry, there has to be an explosion in biosensors. Yes. Um, and so what's the plan? <laughs> plan is it's up to you guys, right? So um, I, I blew, blew past one slide on this thing, which was the multidimensionality of the problem, right? Is, you know, when you talk about all the different things you want to label, all the sensors you want, um, all the knockouts you want to do, all the pharmacological agents you want to do, every different cell type in the organism, blah, blah, you know. So that's where the data problem gets. I'll leave it to you to figure out the biochemistry. I'll work on the data part, okay? Is that a deal? Okay, <laughs> all right, good. Let's thank Eric again. Thank you.